Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, April 3rd, 2014, and this is the week in charts. I know I say this every week, but this week, I think you'll see that. I mean, we've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Actually, this week, I'm out of Mountain Dew, so we'll just have a little Diet Coke. Got a little bit of a fizz factor we'll wait for here. All right, enough of that nonsense. Let's uh, take a look at the disclaimer screen, and I'll give you my quick summary on that. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right, hey, do me a favor. This is part of the show where I beg for a review. Um, I'm not ashamed to ask for a review. If you, you send me an email and you tell me you like the book, well, if you don't mind, Put that uh, review up on Amazon, even if you agree with everybody else, because sometimes you get people who are malignant and they review the reviews. I can't, you know, I would love to have, I need to clone myself is what I need to do, but I'd love to have so much idle time where I could sit around the Internet and, and review reviews. Uh, geez, I can't imagine someone who's that malignant and has nothing to do. All right, what do we talk about? Well... This slide really didn't tell you much. We probably should just jump right into it. Um, I answered email a couple of days ago. And after I hit send, I got to think, it's like, you know, that was that was fairly profound. I think it's worth sharing. I actually sent it out a couple of my um, clients who are a little bit newer to trading. I thought they could um, would enjoy it. So we would cover that. And dealing with baby poop. And instead of telling you about that, it will make more sense uh, if we just get right into it. All right, do this. And do it well. This is what I told a newbie about, uh, oh, about a week ago. Just take your time. Uh, right now, we could be going through a transitional phase in the market. Things are kind of iffy. Things are a little mixed. Uh, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. You have to live through several cycles like this where things are a little confusing and some others to get it. And to avoid running off to chase rainbows. Just keep it simple. Trade trend and transition to trend. Find something that you think has tremendous short-term and hopefully longer-term potential. And watch the teaser videos for the stock selection webinar. I have a quite a bit of uh, good information there. And if you come here and you click this free video here, this, there's, a, there's a lot just right in that on picking the best stocks. Take short-term profits as offered and trail stops longer-term and allow to widen to hopefully capture a longer-term trend. Trade the best and leave the rest. If there's nothing to do, do just that, nothing. And, of course, plan your trade and trade your plan. Do all that and do it well, and you'll do great. Easy, huh? LOL. Well, not easy, but not nearly as difficult as most people make it. Now, I'm not showing you this because it's the most eloquent piece of writing that I've ever Compose, but the reason I am showing you it is because after I sent this, I got to thinking and I reread it. It went to my sent folder and checked it out and said, you know, I pretty much summed up everything right there. So I think it's probably worth breaking down. So let's let's do that. Okay. Let me just verify that. Uh, is everybody seeing the screen? I want to verify that. I can't see the what you're seeing at this moment. It's not showing me on the menu. Okay, I'm going to assume that you are. Oh, here we go. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Um, good. So the first thing I said was you have to live through several cycles like this and others to get it and avoid running off to chase rainbows. Now, this graphic came to mind, and this is a, a, a chart I put together a while back, and I think it's going to probably find its way into my, um, my book on selecting stocks. If you notice, this market was in a pretty serious, persistent uptrend. Had a little bit of a correction in here, no big deal. Not textbook in nature, but sort of for an overall index like the S&Ps. 
That's pretty normal. And then it continued on in a nice persistent trend. So you really can't argue with the fact that the big arrow, big blue arrow, in this case it's black because it's going to be a black and white text, points higher. On this exact day, I had a client that probably came in right about here, if memory serves. He was with me for a few months. And he sends me the most glowing email ever. And one thing that I quote out of it was, bravo for your system. Well, whenever you start getting full of yourself, what happens, right? So this may be patting myself on the back. Or this is patting myself, patting me on the back for me, I guess. So I felt pretty good about that. But what happened next? Well, the market, as you can see, didn't do much. Just kind of went all over the place. Okay. And then, of course, what happens? Same guy, I get an email, says he is not happy. And I paraphrase that. It was much nastier than that, if memory serves. But I try not to focus on the negative too much. So we'll just put it as not happy. Okay. So if I had to bet, I would bet after getting a little taste of this back here, okay, and then going through this and saying, well, it no longer works, I would be willing to bet that this gentleman is off chasing rainbows somewhere. He's off looking for that perfect system that's going to give him this back here. And he thought he had it with me, and he had it with me for a while. But then the inevitable cycle kicks in where a market goes sideways to lower. Okay, in this case, sideways. Now, if you noticed the last couple of months in this chart, or what? May, June, July. So this is going into summer, and the market got choppy. And that's no big surprise. Now, it doesn't mean you should quit trading. But usually what happens, and I don't want to digress too far, is usually what happens is you make money. And then you go through a bit of a drawdown. And as this market goes more and more sideways, you get fewer and fewer positions. So your drawdowns begin to flatten out. You get stopped out of existing positions. And there's just no new action that needs to be taken. A lot of people put a lot of pressure on themselves during this sideways period. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in the meantime. The point I'm trying to make here is people who start doing great times don't know what hit them when they hit the inevitable bad cycle and then they go off to change rainbows thinking that there's a system that's always like this okay um, Mike Moody and I think he's formerly of Dorsey and Wright he just um, recently went out on his own he was speaking at the American Association of Professional Technical Analysts meeting uh, it's a great organization um, I'm a huge fan, and I'm also a board member now, and we have some unbelievable talent in this organization, and, and if you've been coming to these shows for the last year or two, you've heard me, uh, I go to one of these meetings and I talk about it for a year. These little gems that I pick up are just amazing, uh, obviously not just in the in formal conferences, but outside of the conferences, and Mike Moody was up talking about relative strength. And when he was with Dorsey and Wright, they ran a lot of money with some relative strength models, and he was talking about it. And it really confirms what I do from a momentum standpoint. Now, I maintain momentum lists and relative strength lists, and I even track them. I have what I call a Landry 100, which for me is just in-house use. But from that, obviously, people in the service, if there's a stock that sets up, they get the benefits of the stock that sets up. And also, for me, on a personal and selfish basis, I learn a lot, or I have learned a lot about the markets. Now, one thing I already knew going in, and I experienced it quite often with my momentum list, specifically the one I track on a day-to-day -day basis, Landry 100, is that it does have some pretty bad drawdowns. What happens is with momentum, especially high relative strength, sometimes it's the bigger they are, the harder they fall. Now, the problem with that is, you think, okay, well, this is at a high level. Maybe I should quit. But then it keeps on keeping on going higher and higher and higher. And eventually it does in badly. Like back here, it's like, well, it's just going on higher and higher and higher. And it has a little bit of a correction. And then you're thinking, well, maybe it's over with. And it would happen as it goes on and on and on. Before it does, it did put that sideways correction that it did in here. Uh, but when momentum ends, it usually ends badly. It usually looks something like that. 
Right now, it's possible, and we don't know for a fact, and we're going to flesh this out in a few minutes when we get the overall market, it's possible that that relative strength game has ended, and I'm going to venture to say that it has likely ended in biotech and the drugs because they've been going straight up forever. So Mike's giving his talk, and I interrupt him and say, Mike, this relative strength game, I love it. It's fantastic. But when it ends, it usually ends badly. And he kind of shook his head and agreed. And he showed where one of their models had a very significant drawdown, but still made a lot of money longer term. And I told him, I said, hey, if I could solve for the drawdown part of high relative strength, it'll be the last day you see my fat ass. And I asked him, what's his solution? And his answer was quite surprising. You have to embrace and accept it. And I think embrace and accept, without going off on too much of a tangent here, I think that works for whatever methodology you're in. Like I often say, if you're trading my methodology, when you get to the trading psychology part of it, there's your mind, there's the money management, and there's a the methodology. And a big part of trading psychology, a huge part of trading psychology, is understanding the methodology. And if you know that there's going to be different cycles where you're not going to do really great, but longer term you'll do just fine, you have to learn to take the good with the bad. Now, why am I going off on this tangent? Well, the bad with the good, I guess I should say. You have to learn to take the bad with the good. And Mike's answer was, if you're going to have a baby, you're going to have some baby poop. And that's just the reality of having that babe. If you want to have a child, it's a wonderful thing for the most part. <laughs> All you parents in here probably nodding your heads. Uh, but you're going to have some baby poop. And that's, that's um, he made it sound like they actually tell their clients just that. So it sort of comes with the territory. So just know that there's going to be some flat times in here. And let's count the months in this particular case. And I can pretty much guarantee you, if I went in and pulled the spreadsheets out, for let's see, one, two, three, four. For those four months, I'd be willing to bet that the service did not do too good. And I'm pretty sure it was printing money back here, okay? And then it didn't do good for a few months. So probably right around here when he quits, um, I don't know what happened just yet, but we could go in and look at, uh, let me make a note of that. That's what, July of 2012. I'd be willing to bet that the market, in fact, we could do it right now. I'd be willing to bet that sometime thereafter, the market began to trend. Now, I swear to look at the charts. I mean, I know we're higher now than we were then other than that. But let's just see where we were, SP500. And if we go to July of, was it 2012? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, so it did kind of chop around, but it went on to make new highs. And then it kind of faked out a little bit in between. And then we had a pretty good run in here, okay? So if you quit as soon as things get a little iffy and go off to change rainbows, you might eventually end up completely out of phase. Now, the next thing I said was just keep it simple. And here's something that amazes me. I've been around for a while, and I've seen it all, and I've seen a lot of people show a lot of systems, and and in their systems, system will look like, you know, there'll be a sell here, and then there'll be like a, a buy here, and then there'll be like a sell here, and then there'll be like a buy here, and then there'll be like a sell here, and it'll look like this. Okay, and if all you did was, now maybe this is a little bit more exaggerated, but all, if all you did was maybe get in this pullback here, okay, or let's say you had like a, a moving average or something, and let's say the market came down or whatever, and the moving average got hit, a lot of times I'll see all these signals, like a dozen maybe even 20 or 30 signals, believe it or not, in a relatively short period of time. 
And I'll sit back and say, well, even if you just traded some little simple system like daylight, meaning that you stayed long as long as the price has stayed above the moving average, instead of doing all this chasing your tails with these with this oscillator and that oscillator and the complex oscillator and the invert oscill inverse, os inverse oscillator, etc., and trade all those signals, just reduce it down to something simple. And almost invariably, that's the right word I'm looking for, it seems like whenever someone gets up and shows a system, and not to take anything away from them, they might have a very good system, a very viable system, but especially if they're showing a, a noisy system that trades a lot, usually nine out of ten times I could show you where it, a simple system would have gotten in. And um, this is not related to what I'm saying here as far as systems, but like somebody once, somebody was up and they were speaking, and they said, uh, you know, market looked like this or something. They said, who would have, who would have gotten in right here? And I raised my hand and I said, I would have, because in that particular case, there was uh, like a bow tie buy signal or something, and I forget what contract it was. It might have been coffee or something, and um, but just a very simple system instead of trying to do all these complex things, you'd be surprised at how keeping it simple can actually work. Now, what I said earlier was trade the trend, okay? And see, I'm not that eloquent. I should have said trade the trend, I guess. L trend, la trend. <laughs> trade the trend and transitions of trend. Well, if you guys remember from a while back, and I put did many presentations on this one, this was CLDX. It had a nice little knockout move, and it didn't really work out too well right away. But within a little while, we were able to capture a pretty decent profit on this stock. And then that longer-term trend resumed. It wasn't a straight line higher, but as you can see, it worked out pretty good with some consolidations in between. But we had a very, very solid trend way back here. And, yeah, it did trigger consolidate a little bit. But for the most part... It worked its way higher. So trade that obvious trend. If you're newer to trading, then only trade the obvious trend. You should be able to draw a big arrow on the chart. Now, if this, if I zoomed in on this chart here, that move, which doesn't look like a whole lot on this particular chart, if you zoomed into where that filled the chart, it would look like this, okay? So you can certainly draw your big blue arrow on the chart for your uptrend. Now, the other thing I said is, and transitions of trends. I guess I should have put the word obvious in here. I wonder if I did. Usually I do. Let's just double check that. we got time. Let's see. Nope, I didn't put the word obvious. So the word obvious should probably go in here. See, I told you it could be more eloquent, but you get the gist of it. And we come back to our old friend, SPWR. It made all-time lows here within a longer-term downtrend, as you can see. And it tried to bottom out here, but by the time you get a trigger, what happens, it comes all the way back in again. And then it just consolidates, and then there's, there's no trade. There was actually no trade back here off of this low. But then look what happens. It gets its act together. It does two things. One, it makes a bow tie. And two, it makes a very nice thrust from lows and then pulls back. And it ran about 600% hopefully in counting from those lows. Now, did this is the salt in the wounds trade from last year. So it does, it does it did take a little bit of discretion to stay with it. It hit the stop at 9 exactly, and then it turned around and went straight back up. I went on to say, find something that you think has tremendous short-term and hopefully longer-term potential. Watch the teaser videos for the stock selection webinar. Okay, So if you've got a stock... That's done this and did this, and then you got that beautiful transition and trend. It's just beautiful bow tie, first thrust, all the Dave Landry and the world patterns, and then you got a little pullback. Also, have a big picture cup and handle, and everything just looks absolutely perfect. You might want to think twice about taking that setup because anybody who bought during this base might be looking to get out at break even. So, that's just one of many things. You need to look for, but start at least by watching the teaser videos. I know I'm such a tease, but there's a lot of good information in there, if I say so myself. The other thing you could do is watch, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this 
later when I get to announcements. But watch all of these archive shows because especially when people ask me about stocks, and that's that's one way to learn about stocks is to look at a lot of stocks and see what I like and see what I don't like. Not that it's my way or highway, but I've been around the block a time or two, and I know what makes a good stock and what makes a stock that's mediocre. We may agree to disagree, but in general, it's going to be fairly, um, I don't even know if common sense is a word, but it should, be, uh, it should be common sense as to what works and what doesn't. Now, you want to take short-term profits as offered. Now, in this particular case, it wasn't quite a short-term profit. It, it did take a while. But in getting that stop up to break even, okay, and we almost got stopped out here, we're able to sort of, for lack of a better word, play with the market's money, okay? So you take the short-term profits as offered. And remember, when we start out, we start out pretty tight on our stops. But as the market moves more and more in our favor, we let those stops open up. Why? To hopefully capture that longer-term trend. And that's the secret, or one of the secrets, I should say. Stock selection is probably the secret. The second secret is pretty simple. It's the money management. And it's not that complex. You just let that stop, STOP, widen out so you can hopefully ride out some longer-term corrections in the stock and stick with that stock for a long, long time. That is where the real money is. That is how you, that's what makes your year, okay? One or two of these a year is all you need, okay? Now, I talked about trading the best and leaving the rest. And if you go look at my marketing page on my website for the stock selection webinar, this is we did this on December 14th. Some of you guys and girls, ladies, I should say, were um, here for that. And these are my the exact stocks I picked. And there was one or two other ones down here. But they all ended up profitable, I think. And even if you didn't use any money management or any uh, entries or anything, the moves that they made over the next month or so, for the most part, I mean, this one didn't do a whole lot, but for the most part, were pretty substantial. This one went triple digit. This was 88%. This was 45%. So if you could pick a few of these each year, this is going to make your entire year. So make sure you at least watch the teaser video. By the way, if you're here right now, um, I'll tell you what I'll do. We had six months here. We'll do a whole year. So we'll do 12 months or one year, whatever, one year, however you want to look at it, free. So just say, um, just say, hook me up, Dave, <laughs> and I'll be happy to do that. And that way you're going to have the stock selection webinar to see how exactly how I do it. In fact, I actually walked through the entire process, and this is what I found, okay? And this is what happened, good, bad, and indifferent, okay? And then you can, you can see me do it in real time. You occasionally see a portfolio. I'm going to show you one this week. Um, and you can compare your notes to mine. Now, the next thing I wrote was, if there's nothing to do, do just that. Nothing, okay? Like I said earlier, your equity curve probably looked like this, and then it went like this, and then it just kind of flattened out a little bit. You had that drawdown, and then it flattens out, and then the market begins to trend, and you go back to making money. If you look at my YouTube video, go to, I think it's on Market in a Minute page. You could join my, um, let's see if we can get this to come out here. If you go to my YouTube video, on my service and just join my YouTube. Either go to links here or go to market in a minute. I think it might be under links, but somewhere on here you could join my YouTube channel. And I did a video on my trading service. And if you look at that video on my trading service, you'll see something pretty interesting. In fact, if you go in and watch the archives of these presentations, you'll see something interesting. You'll see that here is the, um, the S&P performance down here, and here's the equity curve up here, and you'll see something that look like this, and you'll see something look like this, and then you'll see the market roll over a little bit, and you'll see this roll over a little bit. If you see the market continue lower, and then what will happen, this will bottom out and start going up again because we do play the short side, okay? 
So you'll see that that equity curve is not going to be a perfect line like that. If it was and always was, that's another one of those cases where you'd never see my fat ass again. By the way, the reason that relative strength works, the reason that, okay, Paul, you got it. Paul says, hook me up. You got it, Paul. The reason that relative strength works, the reason that momentum works, the reason that my methodology works, the reason that trend following works is because sometimes it don't, okay? Now think about that. If the market always looked like this, okay, then Mr. Bravo here would still be in the market. In fact, everybody and their brother would still be in the market because it just goes up, okay? Well, obviously, if everybody's on one side of the market, it will stop working. What happens with trend following or any other methodology for that matter, but I'm not going to speak about other methodologies. I'll let them do that. But with any methodology, specifically trend following, because I'm mostly familiar with it, there will be times where it just flat out doesn't work. And because it doesn't work over a given period of time, people will quit and go off and chase rainbows. And then guess what? It'll start working again. So when I'm talking with Mike Moody, uh, I think we seem to agree. At least I said I, I made the case, and he didn't he didn't, he didn't uh, uh, contradict me or anything. He pretty much agreed. I said, uh, the reason I guess this works is because sometimes it don't. And he kind of shook his head and said, yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think he was in agreement with me. So if there's nothing to do, okay, now it doesn't have to be rocket science. You see me talk over and over and over, okay, about the simplest thing, the simplest of all things you could do is say, where's the market? 1325. Where was the market a week ago, a month ago? Two months ago, let's see, one, two, three, four, four months ago, 1325, okay? Well, just connect the dots on a net-net basis. Yes, there's some oscillations around that, but once you are here, you have the benefit of this hindsight going backwards all the way to February, and you can see, well, wait a minute. This market on a net-net basis has done absolutely nothing, okay? So you need to think long and hard about your next move. Should you be trading this sideways market? And the answer is no. Be careful. Unless you really, really, really like a setup. Maybe a little solar stock. And the solar stock started setting up, uh, well, it was fall, so it was a couple of months later. But maybe you see a little solar stock that looks really, really good, or a little biotech. Some of those biotechs had some pretty good runs from back in mid-2012, okay? Then you take it. But for the most part, you got to make sure you really, really like it. So if there's nothing to do, you need to do just that, nothing. Doing nothing is very hard for successful people. If you are here, you are probably a successful person. I recognize a few faces. I see a couple doctors in here. You're smart, and you work hard. I know you work hard. I know you personally. So you didn't get you didn't get to be successful by sitting on your buttocks, okay? But in trading, sometimes you need to do just that. Now it doesn't mean you stop doing your analysis, keep doing your analysis, or go off and save lives, build buildings, or fix automatic transmissions or whatever great things you do. Keep yourself busy doing that. I'll continue to look at look at the charts just in case that little solar stock or biotech or something, that one big elusive winner or two big elusive winners, whatever the case may be, that makes you year, shows up in the middle of this fluff. But I can guarantee you, once I identify this fluff, okay, and it's not rocket science, maybe a month of going sideways, you got to start scratching your head a little bit and wonder whether or not the trend has ended or at least become sideways, okay? So after, let's say, a month or so of that, then you just need to get more and more selective on your new positions. And there will be times where you don't do anything. And, of course, this is where we beat the dead horse. Plan your trade and trade your plan. Okay. Um, along those lines, I left this slide in from the last several weeks just because I think it's a cool graphic that I made up. Um, don't worry about if we're in a bull market or if we're in a bear market, okay? Don't try to 
predict that overall market to a T. Do look at it and say, well, have we going, are we going up, are we going sideways, or a question mark, okay? But don't try to make any big picture predictions. And then again, you need to plan your trade and trade your plan. I'm not going to beat the dead horse too much on this this week because I think I've done a really good job, if I say so myself, in prior shows, especially in more recent times. But it's amazing that people will not plan their trade and they will not trade their plan. And like I said a few weeks back, this is all I'm going to say, I promise. But as I said a few weeks back, I think the reason people do that, I was out for a little walk, walking the dog, trying to clear my hair, get a little head, get a little uh, fresh air. I think the reason people do that is as soon as you make a plan, you have admitted the possibility of failure. Well, guess what? On every trade, no matter how great it looks, there's a possibility of trade. I look at a trade and say, I'm going to do really great on this trade. And you know what? Sometimes I do, and sometimes it turns into a real big stinker. And it's like sometimes I'll tell my clients, you know, I knew that one was going to go. It just looked fantastic. And they're like, why don't you tell us? It's like, well, because I often think that, and I'm not always right. And that's when you get into a lot of trouble. And that's why you plan your trade and you trade your plan. Okay? Now, enough about all that. Let's see. Um, we've got some questions coming in. Dave, so when you say let the stop widen out, does it ever happen for the second loaf that it ends up below the entry level? No, 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 no. Okay. What I'm saying is you let the stop widen out, and it might be easier to actually look at the, oh, one more thing. So do all of that, okay, and do it well. As I've been telling you guys and girls all year, and it's not that I haven't done this before, but now I'm really making a conscious effort to do it. That, um, what do you call it, deliberate practice I often talk about. Do it well. It's like ever since I did the stock selection webinar, I've really been obsessed with the picking the best of the best. Okay, and I'm listening to that little voice inside my head when I'm flipping through charts for the third time and about to fall asleep, thinking, geez, Dave, there's probably nothing out there. There's not much out there. The ones you found are probably the best. There are other times when I'm flipping through charts and I'm just so excited because there's so many good things going on, I know that, that those are better times to trade. But my focus is finding the best of the best stocks and getting better and better and better at stock picking. So do it well. Don't try to make something happen. Like I've said many, many times before, I was on a project a while back, and Peter Mothy was the ringleader. Peter mothy has been around the block a few times. He was um, he's ran some uh, large organizations. Some of you probably would, you, if you I mentioned some of the names that he's worked with, you probably would recognize the names. Uh, you probably read about these famous traders. So he's he's been around quite a bit. Anyway, he was the ringleader for this project that was on a couple years ago. And I told him, I said, to, I know some of you are rolling your eyes, like, Dave, how many times did you tell a story? Well, I'm going to keep telling the story until you people get it. <laughs> and I told him, I was like, Peter, I don't know if you want me on this project because there's going to be times when there's nothing to do, and I'm not going to submit any trades to this project. And he said, you're exactly the guy we want. We don't want people out there inventing trades for the sake of inventing a trade, for making a trade. We only want to trade from you if you truly believe that this is a good setup. So don't invent trades is a beautiful thing, okay? So it, when I say do it well, that doesn't mean go out and invent, and invent something or find the um, lesser of all evils or whatever when you're looking at a, a crappy market. Just don't do anything, okay? And if you do all that, you'll do great. Now, I said easy, huh, LOL, because uh, I'm working with a few people now, and they won't, they won't plan their trades, and they won't trade their plans. And, again, freshman psychology rears its ugly head. Why? I don't know. I have no idea. I suppose it's because, again, you're admitting the possible defeat, and these are successful individuals. They've done very well for themselves 
elsewhere and are looking to put some of this success into the markets to hopefully parlay that money again. But it's not going to happen for them until they can plan their trade and trade the plan. So do all this and do it well. And I know it's easier said than done. And it's taken me a long time to get to this this, uh, this point in time where I could be a little bit more matter of fact about everything. Maybe I'm getting older. I don't know. My wife says age doesn't guarantee maturity, but I, could, I feel like I've matured when it comes to the markets. Okay. But here's the bottom line. It's not nearly as difficult as most people try to make it. So when you're plotting that 15th oscillator, or if you're trying to make something happen and the market is going completely sideways, you just look at the market on a net net basis and it hasn't gone anywhere in six months, okay? Just like you can't catch a tan if the sun is shining, you're not going to make any money trend following if there isn't a trend, okay? Now, got a couple questions in here. All right, let me get back to Jonathan's questions. Jonathan says, So would you say let the stop wide now? Does it ever widen for the second loaf? Uh, that it ends up below the entry level. Okay, first of all, when I say let the stop widen out, that does not mean that you get into a position. Let's say you get into position here, okay, and it does whatever. That does not mean that your stop is going to automatically do this, okay? Your stop will never go down, okay? The stop will never go down. The stop will only go up, okay? So if your stop is at, let's say, $10 a share, it could never, ever, ever, ever go below. Now, if this market comes down here and it's at $10 a share, it looks like it's going to nick that stop. You might exercise a little discretion, pull that stop, and see if it turns around and goes straight back up. But if it doesn't, you get out just below 10 or whatever, okay? And you lick your wounds and you move on. What I am saying about widening your stop is often you don't have to do anything, okay? You just let it widen out. So let's say you're in a market and we get in and you got to stop here, okay? That might be a little more closer than reality. And you're trailing that stop higher. And let's say you take your partial profits and you're at break even and the market does this and then starts to take it off again. When it hits this new high in here, especially if it does so on a marginal basis, you might just leave your stop where it is. So your stop is going from here, this distance, increase ever so slightly to this. So you let that stop widen, gradually widen now. And all you really have to do is go in and watch two weeks, no, three weeks ago, I did the transition of trader to trend trader webinar where I had the little guys with the little hats. I'm a trader, got a little hat, little stick figures, and moved into the next one over. So go in and watch those webinars that I did, and it's going to make a lot more sense, okay? So you ever lose money in a second loaf? Um, there have been times, yes, where you will lose money on the second loaf. Let's say, let's say you come in here, you try to stop higher, you take money, okay? And let's say you got a few shares left open, let's say the stock gaps down below your stop. So yeah, you could lose money on the second loaf. The general statement is that hopefully, and he hate to use the word hope, but hopefully you're able to ride out that longer term trend. It, it resumes without stopping you out, and you let that stop widen out so you could ride out some fairly serious corrections along the way. You go in and look at that uh, chart here and what we did was and we got another one with the stop but you can see the stop probably did this did this came up to break even did this okay and then it went up a little bit and then started going up again and then it went sideways here okay and then started going up again and then we got stopped out right here okay but what you're doing is you're letting that stop widen out okay you see right here it's widened out this isn't to exact scale but it widens out so that when this market begins to correct by going sideways to lower, you're able to hopefully ride out that correction to capture this big longer term move. In this particular case, it came down. You made 152%. Well, you had to give up some of those gains. So what? Okay, that's the baby poop. Got to deal with the baby poop, okay? Okay. 
Albert says, I've read all your books several times as a new subscriber to your service. I noticed that your entry and stops are way much looser on your service picks than you show in your books. Is this a temporary situation? Is your method change? Um, if you read the third book, and if you read, I don't know if you read the, um, if you don't have them, if you have hard copies of the second and first book, uh, in my ebooks, which is the only books that are now left, and uh, every now and then I'll pick up a couple of hard copies. If I see a hard copy on eBay, I'll, I'll buy it um, if it's reasonable. The hard copy is getting hard to find, uh, by the way. That's why I actually buy them. But uh, in the first two books, I kind of made the mistake of making it look like your stop goes right underneath the pullback, and that simply isn't true. In the third book, I think I... I I showed that that's that you actually have to give it a little bit more room. We talk a lot about um, stops in these uh, in these webinars. So if you have a chance to go in and watch the the archives on them, or since you're in the service, if there's one or two, if you go through, go look at my website, and if there's a couple that you want within reason, I mean, I can't send you all of them. It just it's just not feasible, uh, especially because they're not all uploaded, and I might actually have to upload them. But anyway, if there's one or two that you want that I've already had ready to go. Um, on stops, I'll be happy to give you those since you're on the service. Uh, but many times I'll talk about protective stops in here, and you have to be outside of that normal volatility. And it's as much an art as a science. And one of my clients uh, just he called me the other day, and he says he just have a, and, and I'm just quoting him. I'm not. I don't want to fill myself too much because trust me, fill my ego too much because um, the market's going to humble me, <laughs> you know, sooner or later. Uh, like today, for instance, uh, kind of getting humbled a little bit by the markets. But um, as far as the stop place, but he just thinks I really have a gift for that. And it's just from looking at markets for a long time. And, and I have solved so many people's problems. Haven't made any money on that side of the educational business by solving their problems. But it is rewarding from an ego standpoint where I've had a lot of people come to me who are not profitable. And I say, well, it's one or two things. It's either your stock picking or your stops are too tight or a combination thereof. And a lot of people I have fixed, those who know how to read the charts and those who know how to pick stocks, a lot of people I have fixed by simply saying loosen your stops. Now, I don't get any money by telling them to do that, but I do get the personal satisfaction of knowing that I've helped someone become successful. Um, years ago, many years ago, back in the TM days, trading markets days, Geez, it might have been, I'd say probably 2000, early 2000s, over 10 years ago, I wrote an article, The Myth of Tight Stops. It might still be out there on the Internet. And in an article, I said, everybody, everybody's preaching tight stops, but I think tight stops, in addition to many other things, are probably keeping more people from becoming successful uh, than helping them, okay? Dave, what exactly constitutes planning a trade? Just a stop loss, a position size? No. Go to my website, and let me show you where to go. If you go to, I mean, there's there's so much information hidden on this website. Go to free education, and I know it's a little messy because when I went from the old website to the new website, everything got um, kind of mucked up a little bit. But if you go into education, get through all my little videos in here, somewhere in here. And if you, if you have layman's, you got it. It's in the back of layman's. You have my permission to copy it. But if you don't have layman's, come right here on my website. See what says plan your trade. And if you click on that, it's from my Amazon server. Okay. If you save this file, I was hoping it would open up. But anyway, plan your trade. It has a whole list of things you need to do. Where are you going to get in? Where's your stop? How are you going to manage the trade? Okay, you have to do all that planning ahead of time, and then there's a post mortem on that sheet. And again, this is how I can fix a lot of people. Uh, you can give me—I don't know—I haven't mentored anybody in a while, but if I did, it probably would be—I don't know—at least ten grand. If you wanted me to mentor you, which I'll be happy to do for about ten grand. I don't, I'm not sure I consider anything less than that, just because of the amount of work that's involved—it's it's not really. Um, Cost prohibitive. I know it sounds crazy, but it's just a lot of work for for not a tremendous amount of money. Now I'm not being egotistical. I'm just flat out. It's a lot of work. But I could save you that ten thousand dollars. Okay, here I am talking myself out of a job by just you know what? I tell you what. Give me a thousand dollars, and this is what I'm gonna tell you. 
Okay, go to my website, see this PDF, print it off, fill it out before the trade, and then do a post-mortem afterwards. And that's all you have to do. And if you just did that, you would quickly identify what your problem is, okay? Maybe your problem is your stops are too tight. Maybe your problem is your stock selection isn't that good. And you need a little work. This is all learnable. This is all doable. Psychology part, eh, takes a little bit longer, okay? But you're going to go a long ways towards that psychology part if you print off that little PDF or make the copy of the page out of layman's and fill it out before every trade, okay? You know what? Most of you guys aren't going to do that. You'd rather fly by the seat of your pants. You know, it's, more, it's a lot more fun. It's a lot more exciting, okay? You don't ever have to admit you're wrong. But once you start planning your trade, you do, and you're going to become more serious, and you probably will not be successful until you do, okay? So strongly urge you, print that off, check it out, and do it, okay? The myth of tight stops. The name of the article was The Myth of Tight Stops. It's out there somewhere. Uh, I don't know. We can do a Google on it. It's probably out there somewhere. Here, right here. There it is right there. It's on, uh, it's everywhere. See, look at that. There's it right there. Dot charts. I never heard of that. Stop loss myth. I guess put Landry after it. Looks like a lot of people have copied the article. <laughs> That's okay. It's flattering. Yeah. 2001. I wrote that article in 2001. Okay. All right. Let's take a look at the rest of this. Okay. Yeah. Jeff said, I, I can't cut and paste from here, Jeff. But uh, yeah, it's on trading market still. It looks like it's still free. Okay, where where am I referring to in layman's? Um, I'm tethered to my computer right now. My copy's actually in the bookshelf. I can't reach it, but somewhere in in layman's is a is a is a sheet where you can print it off. I'm sorry, you can copy it, but just go to my website, print it off the website. All right, let me follow up on trend following baby poop. Okay, and uh, I'm gonna get to all those questions that you have. Uh, just give me one second to close the loop on the slides. Uh, when we left off, this was uh, a couple of weeks ago. So this was thereabouts, this day or thereabouts. And uh, around mid-March, because last week, obviously, I was traveling to Austin for the um, APTA conference, AAPTA conference. And we had a pretty good number and a pretty uh, good gain in the overall portfolio, especially when you consider this is coming from 100K. Hypothetical, okay. Remember, it's always hypothetical for educational purposes only, just to keep me out of trouble. Portfolio. And what has happened since? Well, remember, this is our trading loaf, and this is our trending loaf. And we're looking for about 1%, or on a 100K account, $1,000, however you want to look at it in the first loaf. And you can see here, Made about a thousand, made it exactly a thousand, made a little bit more than a thousand because it got through the profit target. And you could have made even more if you'd have trailed that stop, but that's another conversation. Made a thousand here and made a thousand here. This is an open position where it has not hit the profit target yet. Hopefully, yet is a key word in that sense. Not doing too good today, is it? What's it? Yeah, it's up a little, or down a little, I should say. All right, so let's look at what happened, okay? Now, if you're going to have a baby, you're going to have what? Baby poop, as Mr. Mike Moody says, okay? If you're going to trade trends, you're going to have some drawdowns in those open profits. Now, if you're going to trade trends from the get-go, you're going to have some huge drawdowns, but that's another conversation. And the way I mitigate that is by using the swing to intermediate approach, the switching of hats that we talked about three weeks ago, two or three weeks ago, where you switch your hats from the trader over to the trend trader uh, when it comes to the markets by staying with that position. So let's look at what happened. Well, the profits in TAN, like two or three weeks ago, were 11.89. As of yesterday, they were 7.88. So you lost three or four hundred dollars there. Take a look at this one. You lost a eh, hundred dollars or so there. 
This one stopped out. This one's no longer so stopped out of a gain of only 581. Well, so what? We were going for a big, big move on this one. Didn't work out, but we made 581 plus 1311. If you did that on every trade you took, you would own the world fairly quickly. Okay, it's nothing. To, it's not a whole lot to brag about, but it's better than the poke in the eye. Okay, and then if you take a look at this one here, now this one here was becoming fairly substantial. Unfortunately, it stopped out, and a significant portion of those profits were given up. And this is no longer in the portfolio either. These two have stopped out since we showed this portfolio. You can see gold, as you know, had a retrace. We were up 2,500. Now it's only 1920. And then this full position here in the uranium stock, URZ, was up $400 on each, $400, which is $800 total. And then now it's only up 280 and 280, whatever that comes to, 560, all going to fly. So you went from 800 to 560. Now this one here went from 900 to 1325. So we did actually have one that worked out over the past couple of weeks. So overall, over the last few weeks, you took a $3,000 and change drawdown to those open profits. Well, first of all, it's open profits. And like um, Curtis Faith wrote about Richard Dennis in one of the turtle books, I forget the name of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's The Way of the Turtle, I think. Uh, if you're going to read a turtle book, I haven't read them all. I've kind of skimmed through a few of them, but that's, that's one. that one is worth reading. It's both uh, educational and entertaining at the same time. It's a good book, The Way of the Turtle by Curtis Faith. Go to my website. It's on my website. I'll make like 50 cents if you get it from me. Um, and I'll, throw it, I'll toss that money in a plate. Um, anyway, so you lost $3,000 of open profit. So in, in The Way of the Turtle, uh, Curtis Faith said that Dennis would treat drawdowns to open profits differently then drawdowns that come from losing trades, or to an open losing trade, I should say. And I kind of like the way he thinks about that, and that's kind of like the baby poop thing. And if you keep, keep this chart in your mind's eye, okay, if you're going to make 50% on the trade, if you quit at 25%, you'll never make 50 Okay, and if you quit at around 50, which is right around here, you're never going to make 100. If you quit at 100, you'll never make 200. If you quit at 200, you'll never make 400. Now, this one did come out, come down, and stopped out at 27 for 152% profit. And you did have to give up a substantial amount of profit. So what? It comes with territory. If every trade went from here all the way to here, okay, again, you would own the world really quickly. So I didn't want to... You know, I don't want to just show you a portfolio when it looks like this, okay? I'd like to have, like to have some long-term clients. I don't want turnover where I don't want the guy that's going to come in when things are hot and leave as soon as they're not, okay? I don't want that type of client. I want a client that's going to be a wee longer term. So I want to educate you to say, yeah, this is possible, but you're also going to have to take a little bit of this. Now, even though this seems pretty big, if this little stock goes up, say, 50% from this 12%, then guess what? That's going to be wiped out, okay? Just one little move in here, okay, is going to wipe that out. If this stock here goes to, let's say, about uh, 55%, it's going to wipe out this loss and then some, okay? All you need is one winner. If this goes up a point and a half, we've taken that loss out. You see where I'm going with this? So all you need is one winner to take care of quite a few losses. It's uh, Ed Sakota was there and um, he whipped out his little guitar. If you get a chance when you after this webinar of course, Google um, Ed Sakota and his little trend song. He sang his little trend song and he made us sing along and, um, and basically he says, uh, one winner pays for it all is one of the quotes in the song. It's a cute little ditty that he did. It's, 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 a, it's entertaining. So after this webinar, if you have time, go to YouTube and pull up a Ed Sakota's um, video on trend trading. And it's true because you just need one gain. So if just one of these that's still open turns into the mother of all winners, okay, goes up 
another 50% or goes up 100% or 200% or 400%, then this is going to totally eradicate this number and then some. So if you get a trend follow, you will have to deal with losses, both losses in general, just a generic loss because you're not always going to be right, always going to be right and you will have to deal with some losses to open profits. But like I keep showing in this chart, you this stock, and this is a perfect example, because this was not a route. This stock didn't go from uh, 10 to whatever it went up here. Where is this there? 11? Oh, is it 20 something? I can't read this chart. Okay. It, did, it wasn't a route straight up. It, it went sideways, went up a little bit, came down, went sideways, went up a little bit, came down, went up, went sideways, came down. So you had plenty of drawdowns to open profits along the way. But the net net result, and that's what you got to look for. Now, you doctors out there, you have to be perfectionist. You know, it's like if you get a cut on somebody, you, you got to make sure you don't cut a little too much, right? You don't want to hurt anybody. You don't want to kill anybody. Well, you're not going to have that perfection when it comes to markets. It, it's, um, let's just say there's baby poop, okay? <laughs> uh, Jack says, plan the trade, trade to plan on page 109 of layman's, and that is uh, that sounds plausible. Okay, and Fred says the same thing. Uh, somebody was asking, yeah, the post mortem too. There's a post mortem on that plan the trade thing, and I think this is important too to go back and look at your trade and know if you played it right, if you did it right. Okay, and if you made a lot of money and you follow and you followed your rules, you did it right. Okay. If you lost money and you followed your rules, did you do the right thing? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I know. Your bank account got smaller, okay, and it doesn't feel good. But if you follow that plan on every trade, eventually you're going to get that big winner that I love to talk about in these shows, okay? Page 109, YM, okay? You see, you were not that far up from Larry Connors. Loose stops, closer to no stops. No. No. There's a big difference between no stop and loose stops, okay? And, you know, let's go back in and look at something here. Let me show you something cool or something that – let me show you what no stops would do, okay? Let's say that this stock we got in at 13, let's say the company goes, goes bankrupt. Okay, trust me, it happens. Okay, so you would lose thirteen thousand dollars on that. Well, that's not huge. Okay, let's 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 do a more extreme example. Let's say that. Well, this one might not be that great either, but let's just say, let's just say thirty nine point nine five times two fifty equals. Is that right? 39.95 times 250 equals, okay, let's say you're not using any stops, and you bought 250 shares of this stock, well, 250 shares times 39.55 equals, is my math right on that, is that $98,000, okay, so if you have 98000 and this goes to zero, then you wipe out your account. I don't know if I'm doing my math right on that or not, but you could see that it could add up really quick if you're not using stops at all. Okay. So yeah, there's a big difference between a loose stop and no stop. Ah, you just jerked me around. All right, I got you. Yeah, Alvin, just Google myth of tight stops. I can't cut and paste the link, but if you just do a Google on that. Uh, you'll find it. It's an old uh, trading market article. Okay. All right. Let's um, let's wrap it up, and then let's get into the individual charts. I just want to take a quick look at the overall market. There's a couple things I want to flesh out, and then if you want to start asking about individual stocks, just do so one stock at a time, and then hit carriage return, and then ask about another one. And I'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Uh, the bottom line is, you want to take things one day at a time. Very, very easy to chase your own tail when the market is like this. 
okay? As I wrote in my column, right here it looks like the end of the world. Right here it looks like all clear. So, you want to be very careful not to chase your own tail and get super bearish here or get super bullish here, okay? So, take things one day at a time. I'll probably leave these random thoughts in here. Uh, let the market come to you. Uh, I'm in, uh, I was interviewed by Eddie Z. I think the link's on my website somewhere. It's in one of the old newsletters, if not. And I like what one of the traders in there told people in his firm who are coming in or on the educational side of the business. I forget which one. But um, he said the market's not going out of business. And that goes back to what I said earlier. If we keep chopping around in here. We got one potential stock for today. It hasn't triggered yet today. Okay. So market's not going out of business, okay? It's okay not to do anything. And again, as I beat the dead horse earlier, just continue to play that good offense. If you can't stand it, if you feel like you need to take a trade, then by all means, take it, okay? Yeah, I thought I'm off by a zero on that trade. Okay. Yeah, I was off by a zero in that tan trade. So without a stop, you had about 10. I didn't think that was right because I was like, well, well, I should, you know, should have a margin call if that's correct. Um, yeah, it's it's only ten thousand dollars in the trade. But if you lose, you lose ten thousand dollars on a hundred thousand dollar portfolio. That's ten percent of that portfolio. You're gonna have to make back. You're gonna have to make back eleven percent just to get back to break even. Okay, on that one trade, you do that on two trades. And then all of a sudden, now you got to make back 30, 40 percent in three trades. You're, you're pretty much wiped out. Okay, so you have to use stops, unfortunately. But hey, if you want to build a system and have it look good, then don't use stops. I mean, when I first started programming systems, when I first figured out how to program a profitable system years ago, I had a degree in computer science, and I thought I was going to kick some butt and own the world. And I programmed night and day, literally. I was pretty obsessed. And when I got my first profitable system, I said, all right. Everybody says this money management thing is very important. I'm going to put some stops in there. Okay, control those losses. Mitigate their drawdown. Guess what? system went unprofitable. Why? Well, because you stop yourself out before the market makes a big move. But Dave, you just said use stops. Yes, you have to use stops. Because otherwise, you're going to end up wiping out your account. All right, a couple announcements real quick, and then I promise I'll jump in everything. Um, this is how we pay for all this. It's about $3,000 a year for um, go to webinar and a couple thousand a year for newsletter and uh, another thousand for websites, putting all my taxes together. And there's a lot of expenses in all this, so this is how we pay for it all, in case you're wondering. No, I'm not altruistic and doing this at the bottom of <laughs> my heart. Uh, I do make some money in this business on the educational side. Um, stocks lecture webinar again. Uh, let's go. I'll do a whole year to anybody who's here today, and then eventually um, uh, watching this. So instead of six months, we'll do twelve months, and so that's um, that by itself is fourteen sixty. Okay, so that'll you get a free year of service with that. Uh, volume two, a week of charts. I just lowered the price on this too, by the way. So now it's. Um, it's it's uh, ninety nine dollars for the entire year, and then two thousand and twelve is, is ninety nine dollars for the entire year too. So if you want those, uh, you can find them on the website. My first two books are still relevant. We talk about patterns all the time from those books in these uh, webinars. We talked about a couple patterns earlier. Um, if you want both of them, if you watch this webinar once again, say hook me up. Just get ten best, and I'll give you this one since you're uh, since you're here today. Take a time out of your busy schedule. And then uh, if you're just interested in, in trying to trade trading services, some information down here on that. All right, let's 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 get into the overall, let's get into the markets. Um, first thing I want to do is I want to look at the macro of the overall market, and then I want to work into the micro. I'm sorry, let's do just the opposite. Let's work on the micro, and then let's uh, work out to the macro and see what's going on. Okay, first of all, let's take a look at the P's. These guys talking about. They ever talk about trading in there anymore? No, I don't think that. I don't think so. They bitch about politics or whatever. Ugh. You know, that's just gonna piss you off. You gotta decide what you want to be. You want to be a politician? <laughs> you want to be? Uh, you know, what do you want to be? You want to trade? You got to ignore all that stuff. 
All right, what's going on? Well, the peas just kind of popped out of their little trading range in here. And I didn't ring the bell and say, oh, it's all clear. Let's, the water's fine. Let's hop in. In fact, I've been a little bit skeptical lately, and this is why I take things on a day-by-day -day basis. You can see we just kind of popped out that range. And admittedly, the market looks pretty good. But today we're giving up a little bit. And if we come back into the range, okay, then you might have to ask yourself the net-net question, okay? Where's the market now? Let's say we're coming back to 1875. Where's the market now, 1875? Where was it at the beginning of March, 1875? Hmm, getting a little sideways in here. Might want to just make sure you really, really like a setup. Don't go crazy bullish or crazy bearish as long as everything's a little sideways. But the P is losing a little steam in here. Ideally, I like to see him just blast out of that range and not look back, obviously, as a trend guy. Back to chart, way out. So far, so good. Major, big, longer-term trend so far remains intact, obviously. Let's take a look at the NASQAQ. Yeah, and we'll get to those stocks in just one second. I'd be happy to get to those. All right, if I can grab this thing. Okay. All right, let's take a look at the quack. Now, as I wrote in the column this morning, the quack has a little bit more of a retrace look to it. A secret, well, not a secret, a trick that I like to do is, when in doubt, take the chart out. And you can see, when you take the chart out, you've got a thrust down followed by a retrace. That kind of helps you to see through the noise of the market. Now, so Dave, you're going crazy bearish in here? No, I'm not going to go crazy bearish because... Let's just see where we were, and let's see where we are, okay? And if I do that measurement from the peak down, and it pops up in a new window, we're only 2.5% off of the peak. Now, 2.5%, it's nothing to sneeze at, but the market can move a percent or even two in one day, okay? Certainly a percent and a half in one day. So we're only a day or two away if the market decides to kick it again, kick it into gear from those old highs. Let's take a look at the bow ties. And you can see we have bow tied sort of. No, we did not bow tie down on that move. Okay, uh, it came close, and it's kind of interesting the way the bow ties work. It seems like when you do have a good trend, you get a nice clean bow tie. When you don't have a good uh, change in trend, it gets a little sloppy. Okay, so the bow ties are saying, "Hmm, I don't know." Okay, and they've already flattened out in here a little bit. Although your 10-day is still headed lower, as you can see in here. That's a simple moving average. So there's not a whole lot to read into the moving averages just yet, other than, well, they have flattened out. And then let's just throw the 50 in while we're having fun with moving averages. Okay. And you can see we're back above the 50. And that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything other than if you just stayed long in general when the market's above the 50 and shorted when it was below the 50 for a significant amount of time, a little dip below probably not enough to go crazy short, okay? But if you stay below it for, a, let's say, a few weeks, then maybe you want to be short. If all you did was that, you probably, in general, would stay at the right side of the market. Notice we had three days below the 50 here. We had three days below the 50 here. We're back above again. So it looks like, just based on the 50, we kind of dodged the bullet. What happened back here? Three days below, came right back above. Okay, what happened back here? A couple days below, came right back above. Okay, so I'm not saying this is a magical system, but I am saying, geez, this is a little sim simple way. Remember we talked about earlier, keep it simple, very simple way of possibly staying on the right side of the market just by looking at that 50-day moving average in and of itself and paying attention to daylight. So to beat the dead horse of NASDAQ, still looking a little iffy in here. This morning I said that the Rusty still looked like it was just a bit of a retrace. And when in doubt, take the chart out. Okay. Not quite as impressive as the NASDAQ, but you can see kind of has that gatekeeper look to it, pattern from my second book. Okay. A little bit more advanced pattern. But so far, it is a bit of a gatekeeper in here for the most part. It's not all-time highs here, but your all-time highs were back here, close enough for government work. So that's still looking a little iffy in here. But how far away from all-time highs are we? Eh, less than 2%. So 
So even with today's slide, we're just less than 2% away from all-time highs. So let's not go get crazy bearish. One thing I've been noticing lately, which has been pretty cool, is that these, and I don't have today's data in here. I meant to do an update. These uh, defensive stocks have been hanging in there doing pretty good. Energies, as you can see, nice little run higher. So we could see some setups there, too. What else is defensive foods? Okay, or defensive and utilities. Defensive, meaning that you still need to eat, you still need to consume energy, you still need to uh, heat your home or cool your home, whatever the case may be. My air conditioning is on right now. I'm not bragging, but <laughs> it's on for you people who still coal up there in the north. Um, but these defensive stocks have really been rallying lately. And then what else has been going on? Well, on the flip side, these previous high flyers like drugs and especially biotech have begun to roll over, have begun to implode, have formed bow ties down from all-time highs. That's a pretty significant pattern. Okay, Not every bow tie will turn into the mother of all tops, but every mother of all tops will have a bow tie or some other transitional pattern. Take a look at Internet, another one of those areas. Big slide there, a little pullback. Okay, To those on the service, you'll probably see maybe a short tonight in Internet. Okay, we already got a short in biotech. It's not working just yet, but we might put on a short in the internet. Depends on how things shake out at the end of the day. Don't quote me on that. What else is going on? Aluminium is kind of breaking out a little bit in here. So that's we're back to the good side. Now, up until yesterday, I saw this vicious, vicious, vicious sector rotation, which led me to believe that, wait a minute, this market's in trouble. And it still might be, by the way. But we saw this big push towards defensive stocks, and then we saw a big push away from momentum stocks, at least some of the momentum stocks. Uh, Gary, I think his last name is Anderson, and, and I haven't read his book yet. I'm going to read it because it seemed fascinating. He talked a lot about the sector rotation. It's like his um, presentation was somewhat similar to Mike Moody's in that they were talking about relative strength. But what, what Gary's done is he's quantified it. His book is called Janus Factor. I don't have it on my website yet. I don't, I, I don't like to put a book, book on the website until I at least uh, begin to read it and make sure it's worthwhile. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll probably put it up there because it, uh, his speech was certainly worthwhile. So I'm, if his book is half as good as his speech, I'm going to agree with him. But he's quantified it's where you get these big shifts. Okay, and it goes from the high beta, high momentum stocks to the lower beta, more defensive stocks. And we might be in one of those markets right now, okay, or in the very early phases of it. So it pays to pay attention. It's kind of like I do this, I do all the work, the same work that Gary's doing. I do it empirically by looking at a lot of charts. He's actually quantified it, which is kind of cool. But you know me, I'm still going to go in and look at a lot of charts because, why? Well, I like looking at charts, and I think you get a better feel for things. Now, let's go back to the upside. So we had a lot of these stocks that were kind of stalling towards their old previous peaks in here, such as the banks, manufacturing, retail, and quite a few others. So that had me concerned that these were potential double tops in the works. And that combined with the sector rotation, combined with the leaders falling from grace, prior leaders falling from grace, I said, aha, I think this market's in trouble. But did I go out and sell the forum? No. And that's why I even did a column like a week ago. Don't sell the forum. Okay? Just let it all shake out. So day by day, you just take things one day at a time. Health services breaking out the new highs. Manufacturing made it all the way back to those prior peaks. It might be stolen out a little bit today. It still might be a top. This might be a complex quadruple top or something in the works. But at least so far, it's made it back to new highs. So this is a long-winded way of saying that we had some potential sell signals setting up, and then the market improved. So now I think it's safe to say that things are a little mixed out there, and you probably want to be careful. And, and I think in the end, good stock selection wins. So pick the best and leave the rest. we got one short working now. Hopefully it'll start working. And then we got some leftover longs. We didn't bail on those leftover longs because we're following the plan. Now, if we get stopped out, it's going to suck, okay? Don't get me wrong. It's going to suck, but at least we hung in there. If we just if we had exited last time the market got a little iffy, we would have missed some tremendous opportunities. Net-net, after the correction, we were actually 
we were actually making more money than before. So you don't want to quit every time things get a little iffy. Now, what you do want to do is you might want to get a little bit more selective. And as you put on new positions, just ask yourself, do I really, 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 really like the position? Okay. Uh, just a couple more sectors. Uh, Sibby's, as you know, has been headed higher as of late, banged out new highs. Yesterday, computer hardware also doing pretty good in here in transports. I think I mentioned those already. Always also making uh, new highs in here. All right, we got a ton and ton a ton of stocks. Does NG appear to be losing momentum? Yes, we are long NG. So what? Who's momentum? Okay, it might just be correcting. Okay, but yeah, I mean, I mean, come on, uh, John. Let's just look at the chart. Okay. Where was it? Where is it now? And and where was it um, a few weeks ago? So should we exit? No. Follow the plan. This might just be a correction. Remember, we're changing our ads from that short-term trader to a little bit longer-term trader and hopefully a long, long-term trader eventually as that stop widens out. But right now, we've got a stop in place, and it's come down. It hasn't stopped, it out, stopped us out yet, so we're going to stay with it, okay? Who knows? The world might end. Well, if the world ends, I guess doesn't matter if we make money on NG, but um, there might be a little uh, skirmish here or there or something bad might happen, God forbid, and uh, gold might actually take off in reaction to it, okay? All right, Rose G for Andrea. Or, I hope I got your name right again. R-O-S-G. Call me one day and, and tell me your name. <laughs> Make sure I'm saying it right. Uh, this is actually on my Landry list for today as, as a potential short, uh, but it's um, it's such a lower price stock. It's gonna be hard to short because it's uh, right now it's below five dollars a share. Um, I would pass on that. Usually, if they just make this one big up day, the, the charts get a little out of whack. But because of the lower price, uh, I would um, leave it alone. Corn here, okay. Corn's gonna be uh, what an ETF on corn. No, I'm not really seeing any structure in this one, at least at this juncture. I'm sure at bow tie, you see you had a bow tie back here. It's a commodity, so it's going to be a little choppy. By the way, if all you did was trade bow ties on commodities, if you if you are to trade commodities, first of all, you're better off trading stocks because corn's not going to go up 700%. It might. I mean, who knows? It's, we keep burning our, our food like idiots, but that's another story. We'll get into that later. Um but if you if you were forced to trade commodities, I think the best thing you could do would be to only trade them off of major major lows and trade bow ties and first thrusts and things like that. But to answer your question, I'm not really seeing a setup shorter term in here because you broke out above this little base and now you've kind of come back into it. So it would have to break out decisively to create a new setup. Okay, Lewis says INTC. I'm not going to like it because it's a big thick stock. Okay, and what has it done? Not much. Okay, it's not doing much. It's just it's all over the place. Okay, it's electrocardiogram. Beep 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 beep. S S R I. That's gonna be something uh, silver related. Yes. Okay. Now here's a case where when I first look at this stock, when I'm looking at it from outer space. Okay. Let's see if I can clean the chart up. If I'm looking at the stock from outer space, what do I see? I see the mother of all bottoms. I see kind of a cup and handle bottom to it. Okay, it looks pretty darn fantastic. Fantastic. It's got a little over of supply here, but it looks pretty darn good. But when I zoom in a little bit, what do I see? Well, there's too many days of the pullback. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifty, sixty, seven. Ah, it's almost a month of pulling back. Usually, if a stock is making the mother of all bottoms, your pullbacks shouldn't be too long. But Dave, NG has pulled back for quite a few days. Why don't you exit? Well, because I'm following my plan. That's why. And it may or may not continue to work for us. R G L D is going to be another gold stock. Okay. Uh, if anything, a lot of these golds are looking like shorts, but I don't want to short at these mid levels or low levels. I want to short up here. You probably had a signal right there. I bet you a hundred bucks. You had a bow tie in here. That's a that's a big bet. Let's see. Do I have to pay all you if I'm right? Or do you pay all me? No, yeah, yeah, bow tie right there. See, that was a I took a chance. 
but I knew it. I could tell. You'd have one there, okay? So that would have been your entry from a short, okay? Uh, where else? Maybe right here, your entry getting long. But instead of trading this one, what do we do? We traded A and V because it was coming off of major, major lows. See, we had the bow tie back here in A and V. That looked more exciting to me than that stock that's trading at higher levels, okay? But if you go to short something, short it from super duper high levels. John says, is air too sideways for a short trend? All right. Well, you should answer your own question. Let's see. Uh, a little bit, it's a little bit on the thin side. Average volume about 400,000. It looks okay. It looks like it's in trouble. Uh, by sideways, you'd be a bit of an electrocardiogram. Yeah, it does look like it is a bit of an electrocardiogram. But you did have the gap down here from all-time highs or near all-time highs. That's reversal gap strategy for my second book, 10 Best. Okay? And then so far, so good. I think it looks okay. I think it's in trouble. I think you might be able to find something better on the short side because it is a little wide and loose. It is a little thin. It's probably be hard to borrow. Okay? So just be careful with that. Andre. Okay, it's Andre. All right, cool. All right, you don't have to call me now. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we've got a lot of um, uh, a lot of interesting names to uh, pronounce. I mean, I'm, I'm Dave. That's kind of boring, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, a lot of clients with a lot of interesting names. So I, I got it from now on, Andre. Uh, the voice that you're mimicking certain client sounds very much like Peter Lurie. I don't know who that is. Uh, no, I'm imitating... Um, it comes out kind of Indian sounding, but the um, it, it goes way back to the situation in Nigeria. I, I got up and I showed some, sh I showed a half a dozen charts in the energy sector, showing what I'm seeing now in a wet, in a seminar back when people actually went places, right? And uh, I was showing them, and somebody blurts out, "What about the situation in Nigeria?" And I'm like, "What about the situation in Nigeria?" Meaning like. I could give a flip, and he proceeded to explain to me that they were going to cut off, um, I don't know, their 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 OPEC quotas, or they weren't going to sell their oil, and, you know, I'm kind of like, do not confuse the issue with facts, okay? And if memory serves, and I'm pretty sure it does, all of these oil stocks that I showed went down in spite of the situation in Nigeria. So that's my way of saying don't worry about the news. Okay. A L X N, that's gonna be a biotech related. I think it's gonna be set up to um yeah, it looks okay. I don't like the big old gap that it made here. But yeah, I think it's in trouble. Uh take a look at something like Gilead, even though it's a bigger well, it's kinda of choppy too, I hear you. Um but we're short Gilead right now, and it's it did chop higher in here. But before it did that, it was a little bit cleaner and wasn't kind of all over the place. Even though it's a big cap stock, um, sometimes these big cap stocks, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. But you had a nice thrust down, nice little pullback, tiny little gap here. So that's why I like the Gilead, okay? Uh, TZA should ever touch short this. Should we ever touch to short this? Well, it's going to be one of those stupid uh, triple, dipple, crazy um, inverse things, okay? Uh, I would not. The problem is they reverse split them, but if all you ever did was, was short these and stay short, if you started a hedge fund and did that, you would probably do okay. There is a natural downside bias, even if the market remains flat to higher, slightly higher, I should say, in these uh, type of ETFs. It really takes a market like 2008 to make money in inverse T ETFs. Um, I don't want to get into too much today. I think we're almost out of time. But uh, there, it's hard to make money in inverse ETFs because they have a natural decay to them. So if you're going to do anything, make sure you short them. But due to tracking and leverage, unless you're day trading, stay away from these triple things. Okay, Ray wants to know about PRLB. I'm kind of running late today. I'm sorry, I ran off so much PRLB. Uh, no, it's it looks like it's in trouble, but it's no, it's no real structure of a pattern that I would actually trade. I hear you though. It it it's in trouble. It looks like it's in trouble as a possible short. 
kind of all over the place, kind of thin. Uh, this leg right here, just a little bit of a pullback, looks kind of interesting, but I think I would pass on that one. I mean, it does have some bigger picture topping characteristics to it. I think you can find something cleaner, though. OXGN? OXGN. We've got to hurry up and get through all this. Uh, no, that's all over the place. Who said that? I'm going to give you the Nicholas Fine. Oh, am I, am I charts wrong? Oops, let's go back to that other one. Yeah, this ProLab looks a little better on this chart. I'm sorry, I was uh, looking at a historical chart. Uh, it doesn't look fantastic, but I hear you. It, it, it sold off, so I take back what I said on this one. It does look like it's in trouble. Um, I think you could probably find better, but I hear you. I can't really argue with it because it does look like the mother of all tops. I just don't like all these wide-range days, and it is a little thin to uh, short, okay? <laughs> Draw your draw your arrow, Don. There, let me do it for you. Don wants to know about Ford. That's shocking. All right. Uh, Rick says stock selection webinar. Shameless beginner question. Begging question. Begging question. Uh, payment plan. Uh, Rick, if you if you do get that, um, I think you, you might be eligible for bill me later, which I think gives you either six months or twelve months interest free, same as cash. Um, what you could do is stick it in your cart, and uh, when you go to check out, see if it offers you that. The other thing you could do is you want to give me a credit card, you can call me with a credit card, or you could fax me a credit card on that. But just shoot me an email, and I'm, I'm not to conduct business while everybody's here. Um, okay, ACI, we're over time, but let's just let's just bang on a few of these real quick. Yeah, I hear what you're saying on, on the cold, um, but it does have some overhead resistance, Phil. Let it get past that overhead resistance, and then maybe um, look for a setup there. Okay. A lot of shorts from today's list would have triggered some big down moves on them. CSD. Yeah, I mean, there's some, there's some, it's there's some unraveling going on in the service. I can't, I can't pull them up in front of everyone now. But yeah, I hear you. TSEM. Um. Well, in, in light of the overall market conditions, I'm not really nuts about rushing out and buying anything unless I really like it. Uh, it's okay. I'm not really crazy about this huge gap and all it made back here. But I, could, I, I, I hear you. It's been trending. It would have to pull back. But in this case, it would actually have to make new highs and then pull back for me to get interested. And the other problem is you do have some bad memories back here. And furthermore, it's pretty thin, so you'd have to be careful on that too. Okay. PAH for Gene. PAH. Okay. Uh, we got a bad ticket here, so that's kind of mucking things up. But I don't think I would trade this just because it's had too many days of the pullback, and now it's kind of rallying back up in here. Uh, let's see if we can get rid of that bad day. Yeah, it's just too many days down, and then it's just kind of crawling back up. It would actually have to make new highs and then uh, pull back. SN is a short, SN, Sanchez. Well, I wouldn't short energies right now. Why? Well, energies are making new highs, okay? So there's no sense fighting the tape. Now, the, with that said, this is kind of just, it's down, it's up, it's down. There's no structure here, okay? It's just kind of going sideways back and forth. So leave that alone. PTX is a long, PTX. Uh, you know, I'm going to pass on this one because... If conditions were fantastic, I might consider it, but no, oh, no, look at that. Look at the overhead resistance, okay? If you don't do anything, John, then watch the teaser video, like I said, on the stock selection webinar, and you'll see that I talk a lot about overhead resistance. Or get the flash drives and watch the last 120 hours of these or more, and you'll see that I often talk about the problems with overhead resistance, okay? So it's got a tremendous amount of overhead resistance. The other thing I don't like is, the trend, it tends to trend in chunks. So it just made this one move higher over just a couple of days, and now it's kind of faded off. Okay, it looks okay, but in general, I don't like it when they make just a big pop over a few days in here, just like it made a big pop here, although it worked. I like to see the trend kind of develop and accelerate higher over a number of days, okay? Albert, it says short. Uh, I can't read that. My eyes are too ITM, ILM. Could you, could you put it in caps? Uh, P for James. I don't have my reading glasses with me. 
Pandora. Yeah, it's a possible short. I hear you. The problem is I'm seeing a lot of these shorts that look like this lately. My only problem is a lot of shorts have a lot of support just under the market. So if it didn't have all the support here, uh, then I'd say it might be worthwhile. ILM. Thank you, Alvin. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Okay. ILM? It's not coming up. ILM. Is it thin? Is it bulletin board? Is it... Uh, ILM, ILM. Nope, can't find it. All right, let's uh, let's do one or two more, and we'll go ahead and wrap things up. Uh, we'll wait while waiting on uh, that one to come back up. Jonathan, the whole, my thoughts on the whole HFT debacle is that high frequency trading. Uh, I'm a huge fan. ILM, in, okay. I'm a huge fan of free markets. Yeah, that looks really good, this ILMN, whoever asked about that. Uh, my only problem is I don't really like the scat back here, but it, it does look really, really good. It is in biotech. You know, earlier I said clean. This is clean. This is actually cleaner and a better looking setup than the Gilead. So I'm going to say yes. The only caveat, I'm not really crazy about this gap, but that was a long time ago. So I think I'm going to say yes to this, and I think I'm almost short of giving you a high five. If it didn't have this gap here, I think I'd give you a high five on that one. Uh, now, high-frequency trading. I'm a huge fan of free markets, okay? Don't get me wrong. But I think I think high-frequency trading is kind of cheating the system, okay? And there's, 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 they stuff the quote channel. They do a lot of fun and games. Uh, I'm all for free markets, but I think that if you're going to do – I saw an offering. That's another uh, – somebody showed me there's an offering that's being held up for uh, an HFT company. And they had like uh, several thousand days of profitable trades. Uh, it, it only had one day where they had a loss. They're actually being investigated by the SEC because of that. Um, not that people should be able to figure out ways to make money, but my problem is that it, 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 there's a lot of fun and games that goes on. A lot of those quotes aren't real. So, yeah, I'm Mr. Free Markets, but here's the caveat. If you're going to put out a bid for a stock, okay, you need to honor that bid for one second, okay? I mean, how crazy has this world become where you can throw that out and take, throw it out, take it back, throw it out, take it back? You know, one second, I think one second bid would eliminate 99.99% .99 of all HFT. So I'm a big fan of free markets. I love the fact that they give markets liquidity and all those other positive things. That's great. But I think that in the end, they probably do more harm than good to the markets, okay? So my answer to that is I'm, I'm not a fan, okay? ISO failure. Wick poking through the 50-day moving average yesterday. Tried to make it back over the 50 and failed. Yeah, uh, Phil's a big fan of uh, failure at the 50, and I tell you, that's a pretty cool little pattern. Um, let me see if I can get the 50 in here. We're going to have to wrap it up here soon so the recording can be manageable. Uh, but, yeah, I see what you're saying. Phil likes to trade these throwbacks to the 50s. Yeah, it came back up to the 50. Uh, that's a pretty good pattern, by the way. It's, it's something I, I, that I've been noodling with a little bit because I've seen Phil trade a few times. And I've got some other friends we often talk about the throwback to the 50 uh, pattern. Uh, but, yeah, I hear what you're saying. It came back up. Uh, it also has a bit of a kind of a witch hat look to it at high levels. So, yeah, I think that stock's in a lot of trouble. Okay. Well, look, we're running out of time here, we're, or we ran out of time, I should say. Um, any, I know a couple of you guys are interested in some of the things we talked about. Shoot me an email, Dave at DaveLander.com. We'll take a little lunch break, and then I'll be happy to get right back to you. Uh, everybody have a fantastic uh, weekend if we don't talk again. And um, if not, uh, I'll see you guys again next week. Thank you so much.